think we could do it. Here? Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you, guys. OK. Uh, before we start the topic, I mean, uh, Emery came all the way from San Francisco, and we've been friends and uh, doing investment together for a long time. But why, why don't we talk about our ba own background? So sure. Let the audience know why we are entitled to talk about the topic. Yeah. All right. Um, so first of all, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a really, really cool setting. It's, uh, it's super exciting to see this community of supporting startups. Uh, here in uh, Tokyo and uh, from uh, attract people from around the world. So uh, me personally, first of all, Emery Cronard, I'm French, uh, but I've lived overseas my entire life. I grew up in the US, Scotland, England, Brazil, Norway, Singapore, spent a lot of time in China in a prior position. And I've been doing corporate venture capital and business development for over 20 years. Uh, first for a, a major telecommunications company, both wireless and internet, then for a consumer electronics supply chain company. Uh, for SanDisk and now uh, Western Digital. So my background historically, though, is in software engineering and uh, systems and management. And over the years, I've backed uh, startups who are doing some innovating hard innovative hardware like server appliances, one of the first generation smartphones uh, that had its own app store way before uh, systems from uh, Symbian and uh, the iPhone and others. I uh, was been involved in companies doing wearables, Internet of Things, drones, semiconductors, a bunch of uh, those, uh, those areas. So uh, it's a really exciting time around the hardware renaissance uh, that we're experiencing. And a little bit about what we're doing at Western Digital, we're investing in anything that pushes the frontiers of how data is generated, stored, and managed. So that goes from uh, components uh, that improve the quality of data being gathered or how fast it can be processed. It can be software. It can be systems. It can be cloud service as well. And we are touching on AI. And as far as uh, deep tech, we ourselves are a deep tech company in the sense that we design our own semiconductors. We have a lot of t time and money spent in material science. We have thousands of patents. At one point, we had more patents than employees on the uh, flash side through SanDisk. So it's an area we're very excited about. Cool. So y what, you, what you're saying is basically that you did not invest in Uber or Airbnb. <laughs> because <laughs> they're not deep enough, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I exactly. Yeah, we're, we're investing in, uh, you know, those can be great. And to a certain extent, actually, companies like Uber, when they start getting into self-driving vehicles, they're yeah. involving a lot of storage and a lot of data generation, right? <laughs> the test mules on these self-driving vehicles are generating gigabytes of data per day. They need black boxes to analyze and record all that data okay. for testing purposes. And historically, you would see flash technology be deployed on those in addition to hard drives in some cases, but flash is a little bit easier as you're uh, driving around. Yeah, cool. OK, so my name is Jerry Yen. I'm the uh, general partner of the Huawei Club. Uh, so it's kind of funny because Emmerich was born in France, but then pretty much grew up in the States. And his, his French now has an American accent. And on my side, I worked in the States for a couple of years, and I moved to Paris, so in the reverse direction. Uh, and then so my English now actually have a French accent. So it's, it's kind of like interesting how the past cross. And myself, I spent 12 years in semiconductor, so doing design of chips, uh, NL chips, Wi-Fi, uh, 3G, 4G, and uh, all the interconnection. So uh, as you know, semiconductor is a very, very heavy industry that VC has been shine, uh, you know, shining for more than a decade. Uh, but then now VCs are back in the semiconductor business. Now they are doing new kinds of chips uh, investment, and so which is kind of exciting right now. And so both Emmerich and I, we're both uh, investors in a lot of hardware technologies. And so, so this is going to be a very interesting talk going forward. So the topic today is really uh, so, so something like from lean to deep tech. And so I'm not sure if it's already quite well known here in Japan. But last year, uh, especially in the second half of 2016, that's been the talk of the shop, which is basically uh, it's the, so for, for, for example, I mean, we all know that from 2004 to 2015, there was a big boom of lean startups. Everything, uh, you start with an idea, you iterate, and you roll out the, the, uh, you know, the MVP uh, to your users, try to acquire users, and try to grow as fast as possible. Uh, personally, I saw, I saw that kind of pick out in 2015 when you saw all those crazy valuations. I don't know. What's your opinion on that one? I mean. Yeah, the, the valuations, um, it, it's, it's interesting because it's, you're seeing um, some companies struggle for a while to see those valuations. And you've seen some companies that turned out to have pretty good exits afterwards struggle for years, including doing rounds where they got, most of the equity got wiped out and early investors yeah. took a bath. In a way, one, looking at, one way of looking at deep tech sometimes is essentially it's long tech because it takes yeah. quite some time to actually design systems iterate through them. Uh, sometimes you find dead ends, and that burns money. And if you're doing things with semiconductors, that gets really, really expensive, even if you're doing things around FPGA early yeah. on, and you're always looking at the milestones. In a way, it's also similar to, because deep tech isn't just IT stuff. 
That could be medical devices, uh, genomics, uh, drug discovery, and those face similar issues of needing to raise a fair amount of money to get to the point where they have proof points. And occasionally, you do have circumstances where it's so promising and the potential of the team that is working on a technology is so massive that someone swoops in and does a preemptive buy way before uh, the company is essentially ready for it. And they're not really buying it then at, at that point for what the company's accomplished, which is a usual way of looking at a lot of the M&A, but really they're buying it for what they could do in the future, especially once they're inserted into the larger corporate players. So you can think of some of the automotive players, uh, the large companies buying the upstarts around self-driving technologies and vision processing and things like that because they wanted to grab that before those teams got too mature to be too expensive and have a life of their own. Or you're, sometimes you see that with semiconductor makers branching out into new categories. So you've had pretty good examples of the major uh, CPU players buying specialized chip makers around computer vision and other aspects because they really felt they needed to be in that area or you know buying fpga makers as fpgas become more common and are being used by a bunch of people like microsoft and others to do some really interesting things on the on the processing side yeah so i think it's fair to define if we define deep tech i mean I, back in the 90s i mean i remember the you know the boom days like almost everything was like big tech i mean it seems like Yahoo, you know, by the way, I did not co found Yahoo in 1994. I just happened to have the same name with Jerry Yen. Uh, but, you know, back in the late 90s, yes, there were a lot of dot-com like companies that, that died uh, uh, after the bubble. But if you look at the leading companies, I mean, many of them were doing, like, uh, uh, like my previous companies, Aceros, they went IPO uh, late 90s, right? Yep. So, so that was a very, very deep Wi-Fi leading company building chips. And so majority of the technology back then was heavy. Then we transitioned into a you know, big boom of the lean startups. Like everything was starting. You have a lean team. You try to deploy things to the platform. And now we're seeing a new uh, rebooming of the deep tech. So we're seeing things like, if we define that, I, I think it's fair to say artificial intelligence, uh, sure. including yep. machine learning, deep learning, and robotics, uh, drones, which uh, you yourself is investor in 3D robotics, yep. one of the uh, uh, igniters of the drone boom. Uh, things like heavy new type of sensors, uh, things that, that scale in a, a systematic way instead of like going to consumers and trying to acquire them. So I, I think it's very fair to say that uh, whatever the reason is, it could be because the variations are too high for the startups. It could be just, okay, now the competition is just too competitive on my side. Let's go back to technology. It's, it's, it seems to be very clear that now we're going back to the, the, the sort of like, uh, uh, let's say, narrative where the, your defensibility uh, now has to shift back to technology. Yeah. There has to be an entry barrier, you know, uh, something like that. Uh, I, I don't know if you Yeah, agree. exactly. I mean, you know, if you look deep tech, some of the attributes are complexity of technology and the problem they're attempting to solve. Uh, natural barriers to entry w because of the com that complexity or sometimes a combination of the complexity of what you're trying to do plus some regulatory challenges, especially in the case of things around, uh, you know, pharma, life sciences, you know, others. And when you see startups taking a lean start methodology, methodology and trying to disrupt, with air quotes, uh, the, the pharmaceutical or life sciences regulatory environments, you get things like Theranos, where you know, that, that is not ending well for the investors or, or for the, the company itself. Um, and one of the, th and there are a bunch of like kind of meta phenomenons that are affecting why people are able to do more deep startups. Sometimes these things take a long time and they're fi it's finally paying off now where they're on the right approach. You have a lot of people who have uh, had successful careers with some of the large players in and around the valley. Uh, they've been able to generate enough personal fortunes to launch and uh, set themselves up and bootstrap themselves in some of these early technologies. You've seen enough acquisitions to fuel the fire. VCs for a while started shying away from semiconductor companies because it was too challenging. There weren't exits, no one was investing in it. But he started having a couple billion dollar acquisitions or really quick multiple hundred million dollar acquisitions. And all of a sudden that encourages people. They realize there's a market for it and it's worth putting money into it. And now you're seeing a lot more VCs. For a while it was just kind of basically two, three Valley VCs plus a ton of corporates who were investing in semiconductor companies. Yeah. But now a bunch of others have branched out. And you're seeing, you know, customize the chips around, you know, artificial intelligence, things yeah. around self-driving. But even the self-driving boom is kind of interesting because when I went to Carnegie Mellon uh, in 1990, we already had a self-driving truck that yeah. would drive around well, the Pittsburgh. Carnegie Mellon is the AI sort of like hop Exactly, yeah. yeah. The Robotics Institute has been doing yeah. phenomenal things around robotics and artificial intelligence. And you had a van that would drive around Pittsburgh by itself. The difference was the sensors took a massive roof rack. You still see a little bit today of roof, small roof racks. The entire van just had racks of hardcore servers and CPUs 
that processing power is essentially available here. And that's one of the reasons we saw why we saw drones take off, no pun intended, is all of a sudden you had massive computing power that could handle the avionics, the controls. You had the communication protocols. You had long-distance Wi-Fi, which we didn't have before. In the old days, you have phenomenal accelerometers, gyroscopes, and all these different tools and all these different sensors that are available are inexpensive. And it's really, it's a payoff from the, the smartphone component wars, yeah. where these things are done in such volumes that you have a lot of critical components that mm -hmm. make it much easier to do some of these large holistic systems yeah. um, that, that, are that are deeper. And you're seeing that same reason why you see people doing space, the, the phenomenon around CubeSats and microsatellites, those are essentially cell phones in space yeah. with a, lot, a couple things around it. Drones are flying cell phones with uh, propellers and, uh, and you know, software specialized. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, basically, I think there are many topics we can talk about. I think today we can just want because I think in Japan people are talking about AI a lot, and I, I have my own views on sort of like AI startups, what startups can do and what startups cannot do. So let's just focus on one thing. I think there's a missing link on many of the pitches I heard from AI startups, which is the input data set. So I mean, today the, uh, when we talk about AI, it's actually more about deep learning, so which is part of the uh, machine learning, which by the way was pioneered by a, a French guy called <laughs> also a French guy called Yann Lacan who is a professor at NYU, but he's French, and he has a lot of students that uh, did the deep learning uh, uh, sort of uh, researches, and uh, they're all f many of them are French. And so deep learning is about feeding uh, you know, into a database, uh, into your, your algorithm, and, and train the system recurring, eventually build a network, neural network that can representative, uh, that can take new inputs and have an output. I think a lot of the startups that pitched me, they're missing the input data set. When I question them where the data set would come from, that, that's actually the main problem. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, and, and that also makes me think of one of the other aspects of AI that got really overhyped last year and a little bit of the year before that are essentially chatbots. People got taken away and like, hey, we can have conversational agents and you can chat. I'm like, that stuff's been around for years. I mean, even yeah. conceptually, you go back to you know 1987. Apple had the Knowledge Navigator video. You can you still, can still find it on YouTube. John Scully, you know, keynoted that at a, at a presentation, and you had the notion of an intelligent agent interacting with someone, and it demoed a lot of other technologies that weren't quite around then. You saw some of it with a Newton, uh, with Apple data detectors, where you could write, you know, uh, fireside chat with Jerry in the afternoon at uh, two o'clock, and it would enter, you know, would find the right Jerry, uh, make an assumption on the day, and do all this stuff. And it was gathering a lot of information. You had General Magic, which was an Apple spinoff that pioneered the notion of intelligent agents that would go do work on your behalf with a scripting environment. And that also pioneered things around virtual machines, the idea of the cloud. You would send these agents out. They would actually do their, your bidding on across different machines, interact with others. So you had the beginning of web services, APIs. And that was very, very, very basic, you know, pre-machine yeah. learning and everything, artificial intelligence. And now it's just you just have this phenomenal, re these phenomenal resources of data that's been out there and the compute power and the specializations to make this do extremely useful stuff yeah. in specialized applications. Yeah, I think for chatbots, that's still kind of quite, quite relatively easy because it's basically based on rules, right? Language rules, exactly, natural language. Yeah. And it's text basis. You don't need to do a lot of analysis. So that's why it's like. And, that, and that's, tr that's trivial. That's been yeah, done that's before. Very yeah. trivial. The real difficult one, let's, for example, let's take uh, Amazon Echo, for example. And when Amazon Echo was launched, people saw that that was just about you know, allowing me to buy things and, and you know, in, in using my voice without using my hands. So that's just Amazon trying to sell more things. But then over time, people realized, no, that's actually the, the, it's like a Trojan host. The, the, the main thing is, so in, in the world of AI, there's one problem that hasn't been solved, which is what we call the cocktail party effect, right? So when you're in the cocktail party, you can understand the guy is talking to you. You understand the contents. But if you put a machine there, you can put a, 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 a microphone. But you would pick up all the conversation. You wouldn't be able to discern which conversation was directed toward him. So that has been one of the holy grail for at least on the audio audio side, side of AI. How to develop a system that can do that? But one of the problems of that is that you do not have a database that that's big enough that can, you can train the system. But then now people realize that by putting an echo into uh, American households, all my American friends, like their children. They're not talking to their parents now. They are talking to Echo because Echo always reply, e Alexa. It, it's turned into almost a, more a toy for the kids than yeah. something useful in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, you have children. I mean, uh, when, when they're when they're asking you all the question, what's the longest river in the world? Okay, what's the second longest? Oh no, when when it gets to the, what's the seventh longest, it's really really bugging. But Alexa is not tired. It will always answer the question. But during that process, Amazon is also continually getting all kinds of voice data. I continue to train it. Uh, uh, voice recognition uh, software. I, I think it would be the first one that really solved the uh, cocktail uh, effect party. It, it could, yeah. 
Uh, and it'll be interesting to see where they go with it because right now, you know, we're seeing better results out of, at least personally with our family, out of Siri yeah. in terms of informational queries and things like that. Wow. Then, uh, but, but in then the case Alexa. of Siri, it's actually quite limited because you're talking to the phone, so, so, so it's just one voice going into it. And so yeah, correct. Yeah, absolutely. It's different. And, and because of the nature of uh, the way you know, we've seen Apple do things, they, a lot of the information is done on the device itself or there's more protections around it. And that also gets into some differences between sometimes European startups and, uh, and US ones in terms of how they treat things. So for instance, there are some companies doing uh, connected video cameras in yeah. the IoT space that are doing visual recognition, face recognition on device in the camera itself rather than sending things out to the cloud. A couple reasons for that. One is out in the cloud takes a long time to process. In theory, you can do more efficient processing because you have a larger data set. But uh, there's a lag, which is not good for security. If you have some unknown person or someone person that you think might be a bad character, you want to know sooner rather than later. But there's also privacy aspects that are very nice. The fact that it's only in that device and it's captive in there and it's not in some database that someone can hack into or some government can have access to legally or otherwise. Uh, and that's a significant plus. But that takes that startup took the, uh, made the decision to have basically dozens of PhDs around uh, optical processing. And they took, instead of going and taking the easy solution of taking the your classic kind of video processor chipset, they actually took a really, really beefy pro processor that normally would end up in high-end tablets and did the hard work of coding for that. And at first, people kind of overlooked that. But now, it's a significant competitive advantage for them as all these other companies in the space don't yeah. really have differentiating factors. And why do you want uh, object recognition or facial recognition for a security camera, you don't want the, the, the motion noise alerts because yeah. that's just garbage data. Motion detected, motion detected, motion detected. You get that 100 times a day for a shadow or bird or something like that, you ignore that. But if it's something in your driveway and a car pulls up and it tells you, you know, a car pulled into your, dr into your driveway and it's not yours, you may want to care about that. Someone yeah. walking towards your door, you know, are they wearing a uniform of FedEx or UPS in terms of colors? Or is it someone you recognize? Yeah. Is it someone in the fam you know, from your family? Is it your cleaners at home, something else? You can choose to record or not. So all the things are important. And it all goes towards you know, actual, basically taking advantage of actionable information, contextualizing that, and, and deriving greater value. Yeah. So I think I guess my, my, my suggestion, for my advice for AI startups is that when, when you start an AI startup, and uh, okay, you can be the smartest person on, on Earth. OK, let's put it at uh, IQ of 240. Very good in mathematics, very good in uh, you know, writing code, uh, writing you know, conversion network. But then always think about where are you going to tra you know, get the data to train your machine? Because when we talk about, for example, if we go back to the echo uh, narrative, Amazon is not going to give you that audio library. Right? You, you can have a very, very good model, but please join Amazon as an employee because Amazon, that's the reason why they roll out echo. They want to monopolize that. It's the same thing if you're doing self-driving uh, software. I mean, you don't have the street video for you to train the system if there's a, there's a dog coming out. So if you want to uh, do AI startups, you shouldn't be starting as if, OK, I can do this part of the algorithm. All I need is an input. Then I go find someone to give me it. Nobody's going to give you that input. There's some public. Uh, you know, database like ImageNet, which is uh, open source by uh, Stanford. But then by now, all the battlefield have shifted to getting the data, which is why uh, at Howard Club we're betting on full deck AI startups. Starting from sensor, you build your own sensors, uh, the kind of contextual environment data you want to get, and then you process all the way up. And so for that kind of startups we're betting on, and, and, and for there's no way we're going to let them give those data to other pure software AI startups. Uh. Yeah, I mean, data has so much value. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why you've seen people band together to do things around, for instance, collecting you know, better next generation maps because they need it for uh, their own GPS purposes for the, uh, the in, uh, in vehicle uh, uh, systems, but also they really need it for self-driving. The more yeah. accurate data you can have out there, and sometimes you can do it on your own, sometimes it takes alliances of big corporate giants to kind of cooperate around developing those data sets depending on who they are, especially if they're trying to, uh, to catch up. Yeah. And it's also an interesting thing around deep tech is because of the reticence some people had of investing in chip companies a couple years ago, I've seen a number of cases where companies had the chip, they, were, they had a value a proposition for them, were looking for buyers and investors, and people said, eh, nah, not sure. And they said, all right, well, we'll do a use case. We'll show you what we can use this for, whether it be stuff around power management, uh, speed of uh, response for things like visual identification. And some of these uh, startups have actually had they're actually commonly known now under the brands of their consumer products or their enterprise products using their own chips. And they've gotten to the point where they're so successful just selling the end devices that they're going to keep those uh, chips to themselves 
as a core <laughs> intellectual property, and you're raising money off the back of this new product category, and it's, uh, it's really kind of interesting. And these are things where at first BC said, nah, there won't be use, someone's going to want to buy that. <laughs> and then this thing took off, and yeah. they're, they're proven wrong. So sometimes these things are overnight successes that take uh, five, six, 10, 15 years. Yeah. So we still have three minutes. I want to talk a little bit about exit. So what's interesting, I think I'm seeing two things. So there, for example, Mark Cuban famous, famously said earlier this year that he, he believed the first trillion dollar company is going to be the AI company, right? So he said that trillion dollar market cap, you know, beyond Apple. But my, what I'm seeing is that actually, uh, no. So a lot of the new deep tech, they say AI startup startups, they're being picked up by uh, acquirers very fast. So like Intel already acquired a couple of them. Uh, Google picked up DeepMind, which by the way is a European startup based in London uh, for 400 million dollars. So they're, they're doing that. So I don't really see what Mark, uh, you know, Mark Cuban's uh, you know, $1 trillion company growing up because they're going to be picked up by the cash rich companies. What, what, what do you think? Is it a good thing that the startups are being uh, uh, acquired by big guys for 300, 400 billion instead of trying to grow to a billion dollar company themselves. Uh. Yeah, well for some of those, I mean, I think it's, it's a right, uh, right amount of, uh, of money at, at the right time. Some have been struggling for a while, um, and then we're on a curve sometimes. You know, for an engineer, it's not always just about the, the money now, but also the long-term incentive packages people have when you're acquired, but also it's about, maybe about seeing the impact your technology can have on the world. There's only so much you can do sometimes as a startup, um, and sometimes you look at what the corporate parent can do with that technology and the additional reach it can have and how much it can be iterated and progress in conjunction with other corporate resources. And that really is a force multiplier. And for someone who is creating technology, all of a sudden having this massive distribution potential can be really exciting because you can have even more people using it. And I think, you know, to jump back to riff on the Mark Cuban thing, maybe the first trillion dollars because the AI is going to be a financial services AI that's going to run rampant and well. <laughs> uh, mess up the stock markets and jack itself up. Or maybe, uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. I, 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 I tend to feel, because I also study economics, I tend to feel that if you have something that is very powerful, it's going to get into complete competition, unless you, you have a natural sort of, sort of like mon monopoly. And if AI, so AI is also democ democratizing, right? So I, I think the one trillion dollar company, it, it might be through MMA. It's probably not because you're doing something great and you become one trillion dollar company. And any kind of like, Technology always back and forth. You remember where like 10 years ago, so to wrap it up, 10 years ago, we're seeing like ImageNet, so people are using ImageNet, but they're getting like 20% only correct rate. Now they're competing on 6.7% yeah. versus 6.5% error rate, right? So you see that happening. It's not like, it's not like five, five companies, it's like 20 companies competing on that kind of thing. And that marginal sort of like benefit you can gain from uh, as competing in something that is quickly democratizing is, is going to go away. So as an AI startup, you have to really think about your long-term sort of value, where, where, where that is, and how do you build a defensibility? I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're, we've got like 20 seconds. 20 I don't seconds. think I could address it. But um, maybe also going back to the trillion dollar, I mean, AI now is kind of permeating a lot of companies, right? You have a lot of the classic companies in Silicon Valley from semiconductor, from systems to smartphones, doing a lot under the covers with AI. They don't always chat about it a lot because they will see that as a competitive advantage in terms of what they're going to apply it towards. So I think from that perspective, it's going to be very exciting going forward. Okay. Cool. Well, I think we're, our time is up. Yep. Thank you very much, Emmerich. Thank you. It's great to have you.